Welcome to the next video in the Suggestion App course. This is a complete course where we'll build a .NET 6 Blazor server application with MongoDB from the ground up. There are three things you need to know before we get started. First, this is part of a series, and this isn't the first video in the series. If you're just starting out, you should check out the playlist that's linked in the description to start from the first video in the series. Second, this course is actually a paid course. MongoDB sponsored it so you can put the videos on YouTube for free. Check out the link in the description to sign up for MongoDB Atlas for free to thank them if you haven't already. Third, you can also buy this course on imtimcorey.com. The link is in the description. Buying this course will get you all the lessons right away, the source code for each lesson, a certificate of completion, offline access, and more. It also helps sponsor more free content. The video will be the same as it is on YouTube, so feel free to watch the free version if you want to. Okay, let's jump into today's video. Note there may be more than one lesson in this video, since some lessons are short. Now that we have the basics of the configuration done, and, and really this is, a, this is configuration you can do for pretty much any project, we have done a few extra things like create the folder structure that we probably want, which is pretty standard stuff, pretty boilerplate. Um, but we've done a couple of things with the global usings that might be a little bit new, but in general, we're, we're all set with the, the stuff that we pretty much repeat every single time we do a project. Now let's start working on taking our plan and putting it into action. And the first step here is going to be to take our data design and put it into our library. So let's start with creating the models that we need. Now, we can take the design that we create, that text document that has what our data is for each of the different types, and let's turn that into models. This is where it gets a lot easier if you have a design, because we can just follow along with that text document and say, yep, got this, we need these three things in that, in that object, and these four things in that object, and these eight things in that object, and so on. So it's less about thinking through what might need to go in there and more thinking big picture as we build these things. Now we might miss some things in the design that we'll have to put in the actual uh, model. So keep an eye on that and make sure that you've thought through all the things you'll need, but for the most part, we can just follow our design. So let's right click on models and let's add, let's start with a, a simple class or a simple model. Let's start with a category model. This will help us get our feet wet in this creation process. We can get rid of all these using statements and make it public. And let's create three properties. So prop, that's a snippet. We can hit tab twice and say string category ID. Remember, remember this is the ID we said every model needs an ID, but we're not going to specifically say, hey, this is the ID. We're just going to um, assume that every single one will have an ID. So we'll call it category ID, string category name, string category description. Make sure I spell that right, description. So with those three things, we have our, oh, it's yelling at us right now because it says, hey, you need to declare this as nullable. We're not going to worry about that in this project. Therefore, I'm going to go to my project settings and get rid of nullable in there. So I just went to my project uh, file itself. You can also right click and say edit project file to get here and just took away the nullable. And I'll do the same thing for, um, for my, my Blazor server project. So I'll right click and say edit project file, get rid of the nullable. And that's just, it's a newer way of doing things where we um, ensure that we don't make things nullable that aren't and that we mark things as nullable where they could be null. It's not exactly where I want it to be yet. And that's why I'm taking it off. It creates a lot of warnings that we're going to ignore. I don't like that. So we're not, turn that off for now and just pay attention to the nullable situations. So 
With that, now let's go ahead and mark this first one since this is a, going to be a MongoDB data object. We're going to mark this as BSON ID, which we have to control dot to add a using for. And then one more, we're going to say this is a BSON representation of BSON representation of BSON type dot object ID. Now, this is ugly right now because it's saying, hey, that's actually the full path of it. Let's get rid of that, which means we have to add a using statement for mongodb.bson. I just say control dot there, by the way. And that control dot allows me to do quick actions and refactoring. But these two right here, we're going to see this in every model file. Therefore, I'm going to control X to cut these out. And I go back to my global usings. I said he might change this. We're going to. Global using. I guess copy this and paste it. So now we have two global usings for those two entries. That means that we can reference them in every model, not just this category model. That keeps this file real neat and clean, and it allows us to not duplicate those two lines over and over and over again. So what is this? This right here represents the idea that this is an identifier. And then this down here says, hey, this is the object ID. And what that rep represents is that this is a unique identifier and that it should be assigned a value when we're inserting it into our MongoDB database. So we'll leave this blank when we're creating a new one. And then once we create it, it will get an ID that we can then use from then on to represent this object. So with that, we're done with the category model. Let's go now and create the suggestion model. So I'm sorry, status model. Let's do status model first. The suggestion model is a little bit bigger. Get rid of our usings, make this public. And I will copy this right here because it just, and actually, you know what? Let's not say category ID, let's just say ID. Sorry about that. I can copy all three of these lines. I'm not saying category ID because of the fact that it's already um, an identifier inside the category model. It's kind of redundant to say category model dot category ID. So, the name and description, those can be keywords. So that's why I say category name and category description. But the ID, that represents the primary key, if you will, of this object. So I can just paste that in here as well, because that's the primary key of this object. It's the identifier for this object. So now I can say prop string status name and prop string status description. Now notice that these are all strings, including the ID. The ID is intentionally a string because that's how we set up in MongoDB. That's the identifier type it uses. It's a type of, or it can be a type of GUID, or in this case, it's just the identifier that MongoDB will give it. We don't have to worry about the typing. It's just a string. So that is the right way of doing things is to use a string. So with that, now let's move over to our much larger suggestion model. So let's copy these first three. We already have a suggestion model class file. We created that back when we needed to have something for the namespace. So let's paste in that identifier for the ID. And then let's start down our text file of all the things we need. So prop string suggestion, that's the actual um, short name or, or um, you know, the actual suggestion itself. Prop string description. Prop date time date created. And this is going to determine when this is created, but I'm going to tab to complete this to say UTC now. 
what that'll be is the the time when it was created is going to default to right whenever it was created. So if you create this object, that's the date and time we set for when this was created. And it is UTC now, not now, because of the fact that if a person creates an object on the East Coast of the US and one on the West Coast at the exact same time, the one on the West Coast will say is created three hours earlier. And that's not right because the two are created at the exact same time. So if we use UTC now, they will say the exact same time. That does drop off the time zone when they were created, but that's okay. We don't have to worry about knowing what the user's time zone was when it was created. And we can translate these date and times if we want to into the local time zone of the user when we display them. We probably won't, we'll probably leave it at UTC. And in fact, we probably won't show the time ever to the users. We'll probably just show the date because that's all that really matters. And the only time that that would get a little wonky is if you created something, let's say I'm in the central US, which means that I am minus six, which means that my 6 p.m. is midnight UTC time for the next day. So if I create something at 7 p.m., it's going to say I create it on the next day. And that's the only time it's a little bit quirky, but that's okay. That's not a big deal. Now, we need to know what category this is in. So prop category model. Notice I have no need to have a using statement here because we're in the same folder, the same uh, namespace. So category. I'm not going to set that to an initial value. And we're gonna have another one called author. For now, I'm gonna call it string. They don't have a user type yet for author. We'll get there. Now, this one's interesting. This is going to be the user votes. Now, the type of this, this is gonna be a list of all the people who have voted for, a, for this suggestion. And the things I need to capture for this, really, I only need to capture the user ID of who voted. I don't even need their name. I just need their user ID. So I'm gonna create a, a let's start with a list of string because each ID is a string. I could start, I could do that, but that's not going to be what I want eventually because the fact that I don't want a user to be able to vote more than once for a suggestion. Otherwise, you can click that button up over again, over and over again, and you could really skew the rankings just because you have more patience when it comes to clicking the button. So therefore, I want a type that will not accept duplicates. And so instead of a list, what I'm gonna create or use is a hash set. What a hash set is, is a list that has to be unique values and it will not allow a non-unique value to be added to the list. It will say, hey, I didn't add that because of the fact that it's not unique. So that's what I use for our, our set of user votes. And I do want to initialize that. So I'll say equals new. This is a newer syntax. It allows us to not have to repeat new hash set of type string. So it just keeps our code a little bit more compact. Prop status model, suggestion status. Okay, so this is going to be a, the suggestions, uh, uh, status, I'm sorry, the status of our, our suggestion. So it might be being watched, it might be completed, it might be upcoming, it might have been, um, you know, whatever else. I'm not sure all the suggestion lists we have yet, but those are suggestions, or it might be none of those. So this might be null, and that's okay. And by default, this is nullable, so we can leave that alone. We could mark it as such, but in my mind, it's kind of redundant to say that an object type is nullable when it's already nullable. So we can leave that alone as such prop string owner notes. These are the notes that 
that I will add or my team will add to say, hey, here is more information about this. Uh, for example, if we complete something and set the status to be completed, we're going to put notes on there that say, hey, here is the URL to go watch this video or go get this course or whatever. So that's what the, um, the owner notes will include. And then we have some flags. So we have prop, bool, approved for release. And this is whether or not we have as a team, my team, whether we've gone through and reviewed this suggestion to make sure it passes our community guidelines. So we'll start off with false because of the fact that we want to be very clear here that it does not get approved for release until we specifically say, yes, it has been approved. So by default, a Boolean is false, but I want to be explicit here and say, yes, it is false. Just to be very clear here, that's what we're expecting. We have a bool called archived. And again, it's set to false. And what this Boolean is for is whether or not this item has been archived. So after a suggestion has been on our site for so long, we'll probably clean up the suggestion list. Maybe it's not getting any traction. Maybe the community is not interested. Maybe it's been completed, but it's completed six months ago. We don't want the list to grow out of control. So therefore we're going to archive certain things and say, hey, if it's archived, then don't include it when we're loading or viewing items on our list. So we're going to start off with not archived, but eventually we'll turn that to true for our suggestions. And then finally, we're going to have another Boolean, and this one is rejected. And again, we'll set this equal to false by default. And what rejected is, is this is once we've gone through, we've, it's approved for release is false. So we have this, in the, this list and we say, you know what? We're not going to approve this for release. We're not going to set this to true because it violates our community guidelines. Therefore, we don't want to just be not approved for release because that's going to keep it in the list for us to review over and over and over again. Instead, we're going to have this flag right here set to say that it is has been rejected, in which case it will no longer show up anywhere except in the person who suggested it in their own list. That's it. Everywhere else, it's not going to show up ever again because it has been rejected. So those are the three flags. We could probably combine those into one super set of flags, but like one flag that has all different statuses. But I think it's too complicated. I think these flags are, make it very, very clear what's going on for each of those statuses and say binary yes or no, uh, true or false setting for each of them. Therefore, it's pretty clear what's going on. So that's all of the information about our suggestion model. We do have to come back to this author because right now it's a string just as a placeholder. We're going to change that to something else. So with that, Let's create our user model. So let's create our user model. And we'll get rid of our using statements. We'll make it public. And we'll go back over and get that ID with the um, decorators on top of it. And now let's create the information about our user. So prop string object identifier. This is actually from Azure Active Directory B2C. So this is the ID that comes from Azure. We're going to keep this in association with our own ID. We're not going to use the same one, one for both. We're going to have two different IDs, one for the MongoDB side, one for the Azure side, but we'll link the two that way, we always know how to identify a user. And we have the usuals. So first name, last name, 
display name. That's the name that's going to be shown to everyone when you create a suggestion. Email address. That won't be shown to anybody. And then we're going to have a, a couple of lists here. So list, uh, let's call it suggestion model for now. We're going to change this, but suggestion model. And we'll say authored suggestions equals new. And what authored suggestions are is a list of suggestions that you have created. Okay. And this way we can identify, Hey, what suggestions have you done under the user model? We'll have that list, but that suggestion model is a really big model. We don't need to have all of that data associated with the user, especially since it'll be out of date almost immediately because the suggestion model has things like who's voted for it. And we're not going to update that over and over on the user side. So we'll come back to this model in just a minute, but first we need a second list of models. So public list of suggestion model, but instead of suggestions, we're going to have voted on suggestions. Nope. Voted on suggestions. There we go. And what that is are the suggestions that you have said, yes, I want to add my vote to the suggestion. So that way we can know, Hey, you know, you have voted on 18 suggestions and here they are. So it's going to kind of keep track of everything you've done. But again, that suggestion model is pretty large for what we really need it to be, which is just a little bit of information. So let's think about what information is really relevant to this user model. Now, remember this user model is not the source of truth of the suggestion itself. The suggestion model is. So this suggestion model has all the information about a suggestion, but the user model needs to have enough so that we don't have to load every suggestion model, link the two together like you would in SQL. Normally in SQL, you just put a list of, or an ID here and you link those IDs together and say, okay, I want you to look up the suggestions that match these IDs in the user model, which would get even more confusing because you can't have more than one, you can't have a list in the user model. Therefore you have a separate table in the middle and it would just be messy. But in MongoDB, we have the ability to store an entire object and we have the freedom to duplicate information where it makes sense. And so we just have to have a single source of truth. Our single source of truth is going to be our suggestion model, which has everything and it'll be kept up to date. But when you create a suggestion, we should probably have something that identifies that suggestion and allows us to link over if we really need to get the rest of the information, but would give us enough information so we don't have to do the linking in most cases. So for instance, let's create a new model to put in this place. We're going to right click on models. We're going to say add class. I'm going to call this the basic suggestion model. And I could call this um, a sub model or something else, make it public, but we're just going to call it basic. And this is just enough information to give us the, the majority of what we're going to need. So we need to have an ID string ID, and we need to have a title. And I think that's all the information about a suggestion that you really need to know for in bulk. So for instance, if I saw a list of all the suggestions that I had created, what would I be looking at? Well, the suggestion title, that's it. So therefore that's all I'm going to store besides the ID, the ID I will capture so that I know that, um, I can link back to the entire suggestion model. If I want to see, Hey, who voted on that? Or, Hey, what was the description about that? I'm not even capturing some description here. I'm just capturing the ID and title. That's it. Now we do need to represent this ID and, and tell MongoDB that's a BSON 
um, representation of BSON type dot object ID. So this is not going to be a unique identifier. This could be represented more than once. That's okay. This is not going to be an independent object stored in MongoDB. Just to be clear here, the suggestion model, that will be an independent object stored in its own collection. The user model will be stored in its own collection, but this basic suggestion model will not be stored in its own collection. Instead, it's just going to be a sub object underneath a different object, which in this case will be user model. So the user model, instead of suggestion model, will be basic suggestion model. And so that's all we'll store in the user model. That way we can reduce the amount of data that we're duplicating for no reason. We only really need to know about two pieces of information, the ID to link it to the full object and the title because that's the thing that we'll probably scan through or want on the user side. So on the user side, we'll pull up and say, hey, I've, I've authored five suggestions and here's the title for each. Then you click on it and it will load that full suggestion if we wanted to. Same thing for voted on suggestions. I voted on these 18 suggestions, here's their titles. That's all we need to know. So that's the basic suggestion model. But we're nowhere I need to convert a suggestion model into a basic suggestion model in order to save it. So let's make our life a little easier. Let's create a constructor, CTOR, and I'll leave the blank constructor alone. That allows us to create this object on its own without having to have data passed into it. But I want to create another constructor. And for this one, I want to pass in the suggestion model. We'll call it suggestion. So if you have a full suggestion model, but you just want to store the basic suggestion model, then ID equals suggestion.id, and then the title equals suggestion.title. I'm sorry, suggestion.suggestion. And why do I call it title? Let's call it suggestion. I toyed the idea of calling this title, but I think I like suggestion better. So this is now going to take in this object, the full object, and convert it to just the basic object. What will happen here is whenever you create a new suggestion, we're going to add that to your user profile. Therefore, we'll already have the full suggestion model. We'll just pass that in. We'll convert that. We'll fill in just the two values we need. And that's now our basic model. And we'll associate that with your account. So that makes life easier. The reason I have the, the blank one here is in case you want to do uh, basic suggestion model model equals new. I didn't want you to have to create a whole suggestion model in order to new up an instance of this. So therefore, that's why I created both constructors. This by default is implicit, but if you create an explicit one, it gets rid of the implicit one. Therefore, you have to create this one as well. Okay, so with that done, we now have the user model complete. But let's go back to the suggestion model where we have this author. And we go, hey, wait a minute, we could follow the same pattern here for author because we don't want all this information every time we create a suggestion because it's always going to be out of date. And that's not what we really want about a user. We just need to know a couple of pieces of information on the suggestion side. So let's create a new model. So right click and say add class, let's say basic user model. And again, we'll get rid of our usings. We'll change our namespace to public. And we're going to set up that BSON representation of type BSON, not string, it's going to be object ID. And we'll call this prop string ID and prop string 
display name. Okay, so there's our two items we need. We need to know the ID to link it to the full user account, and we need the display name that is going to allow us to show off who created this. Because on the suggestion, if you go to the details of the suggestion, we're gonna have the user's ID or the user's uh, display name to be shown to say, hey, this person created this. So therefore we need to have that information associated with a suggestion model. Now, I want you to think about, think about this for a minute. What we're doing here is creating some duplicate data, but we're not hurting ourselves because it's not a big deal, these duplications, and we have a single source of truth. So now when I look up a suggestion, I don't have to do linking. I can just say, give me this suggestion. It'll get that suggestion, and I'll have all the data necessary for the typical use, for displaying who created it, just the display name. And for, you know, on the user itself, we're gonna display, here's all the things you voted on, here's all the things you created, and just their suggestion, okay? That allows us to do one call for one record or one object in one collection. If you're familiar with SQL, that's not how we do things. We link over and over and over again, and pretty much every call has linked tables that get joined and brought in, merged, and all the rest. That complexity is not something we want to bring over to a NoSQL database. It's a different style. We have to embrace that and if we do, we'll get a ton of performance out of it. So let's create a blank constructor. CTOR, that's a snippet for it. CTOR again, but this time we're going to pass in the user model, call it user. And we're going to say that ID equals user ID and display name. Notice how the Intel code says, hey, do you want to do that? I get so type it so fast, I forget to look and it's already said, hey, do you just want to do this? And I hit tab and it's done. So really nice stuff there with IntelliCode helping us out. But again, we now have this constructor that allows us to pass in a full user model and get just a basic user model out of that or create just a basic user model. That will make our life a little easier. So now we have a basic user model. We can come back over here to the suggestion. And for author, we say basic user model for author instead of that string or instead of a full user model. So that is all the models we'll need in our class library. We've got quite a few. We've got um, six now it looks like, but four of these represent collections in our MongoDB database. The other two represent smaller sub objects inside of our models to cut down the amount of duplicate data we store and to make our models more efficient.